I'm going to talk a little bit about Afghanistan and Iraq, and I'm going to lump them together as an experience, although they are very different. But there are things about them because they, are, they span a period which almost everyone in this room was directly impacted by. Many of you were directly involved in. They're worth thinking about. If you are going to take part in any big endeavor, but particularly a war, understanding the problem always helps. And when I talk about understanding the problem, if we step back and think of the problem for Afghanistan in 9-11 or Iraq in 2003, right before military operations started, we probably would have said the problem in Afghanistan is al-Qaeda, and we've got to eject al-Qaeda out of a safe haven in Afghanistan. If we looked at Iraq, we probably would have said the problem was personality-oriented. It was Saddam Hussein. And we did a little bit of reading, and we did a little bit of talking about it, but in reality, we tended to focus identification of the problem fairly narrowly. Now, once we got in, you start to realize that a clear understanding of the problem is always wider because there are historical issues, cultural issues, personalities, and a thousand other things that impact on the problem. And if you start to focus on the narrow problem, and wish away the wider problem, or if you just don't ever appreciate the wider problem, then ultimately all those aspects of it come back to haunt you. The second is clarity of mission. What are you trying to do? And of course, soldiers hold mission sacred, but in fact, we struggle as nations and as coalitions to clarify missions well. And of course, that mission changed in Afghanistan over time. And I felt it change when I even got, when I arrived in 2009, there was great discussion. What are we doing? Some organizations, countries had come as peacekeepers, but it had become a war. So peacekeeping wasn't congruent with what the requirement was. And so you had to go back and say, well, how do we change our mission after we've sold our domestic pol political constituencies on it? And then internally, how do we make decisions about how much we're going to do uh, and how we are going to do it. In Iraq, the initial mission was to overthrow the regime of Saddam Hussein, but the rationale for that mission came from a number of different things. It was voiced as weapons of mass destruction, implement democracy in the area, take out a difficult dictator. There were a number of things that were put as the rationale behind the mission, but they also helped define the mission. Because if you said our mission is to overthrow Saddam Hussein, we accomplished that at the beginning of April. He was out of power. And technically, the force could have just driven back out and said, all right, it's over. But then the question is, what was the real mission? What's the outcome? What is the end state we had to accomplish there? We started to clarify that over time, as, as many of you are, are only too well aware. But as it evolved in Iraq, it evolved pretty dramatically. The third point I'd make is unity of effort. And this is something that everybody's for unless it affects them. And so as I always say, everybody wants unity of command as long as they're in command. But the more I focus on this and the more I think about it, the more important I think it is, the more fundamental it is. In Iraq, when we first began that effort, our efforts at the tactical and operational levels down at the military level, and then down at the, the foreign office level, State Department, different players on the ground, they were truncated and they weren't very effective. And then we were left with this damaged Afghanistan. If you remember, we started to divide up responsibilities. Germany was going to take the police. The Italians were going to take the courts. The US was going to take developing the army. We had, by the time I got there in 2009, we had a 46-nation coalition. But we didn't have unity of effort. And that was not because, again, that people didn't want a good outcome, but because people didn't really all define it the same way. But more importantly, nobody was in charge. I believe now that unless you have unity of command, and you can change any word you want if you don't like the military word of command, but if you don't have somebody in charge, it is very, very difficult. Because in modern war, the thing that stops you first is a lack of political support and will. It used to be logistics change, how far can your wagons go in if you're invading Russia, if you're Bonaparte or somebody like that. 
Nowadays, it's political will. And with the speed at which things happen in the media, all of that happens in an accelerated pace. So if you don't think about that in each stage, you suddenly find yourself with potentially the material capacity, but without the political will.